Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank uh, Dr. Ashok Raj one more time for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, for the next one and a half hour, I will be uh, talking about uh, the recent developments in electrocatalytic water splitting uh, with the highlights on hydrogen generation. With, with, with the uh, highlights on hydrogen generation. So, uh, not, water splitting is not only for hydrogen generation, it is also having a lot of scopes for, for other uh, things which are uh, to be discussed at the end of this topic. Uh, so, I would like to proceed. Uh, uh, these are the contents that we will search through today. I will be talking about the current energy scenario and why we need hydrogen. And for generating hydrogen, why water splitting is superior. And uh, what is the difference between water electrolysis and electrocatalytic water splitting? And I will also be talking uh, much more about the developments that has recently occurred in terms of catalyst for electrocatalytic water splitting uh, in which I have uh, finished my PhD and I will also be talking a very recent advancement made uh, out of this electrocatalytic water splitting beyond hydrogen generation then I will finally summarize with outlook on uh, how to uh, go with this field in future. So uh, this is what I am actually going to talk about this today. Uh, I see that uh, most of uh, the fraternity uh, attendees the meeting today are not exactly from chemistry uh, background so i will uh, try to keep uh, all chemistry things that i'm going to talk uh, as simple as possible so that everyone uh, could follow me so yeah let's begin uh, so the first thing very first thing i would like to uh, make it clear here is that why we need hydrogen at all what is the necessity for hydrogen so uh, this graph is taken from world energy uh, survey for 2017 to 2050 which shows uh, uh, increased uh, consumption of uh, fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal. So uh, with the same rate that we are uh, utilizing these energy resources from our aircraft, if we continue to do that, uh, it will be completely depleted by 2051 in, 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 in the case of oil. In the case of gas, we will be out of gas by 2060, and uh, with coal, we will be uh, completely uh, out of uh, coal reservoir by end of this century. So this clearly indicates that we need to go for an alternate energy resource and we also need to think of our environment because burning all these carbonaceous fuels causes CO2 emission which has, which is, which has been increased uh, in a rapid rate has never been before. So we should also care about this thing. So uh, we need to go for alternate energy resources. Uh, the main option that we have with the alternate energy resources are uh, the renewable renewable energy resources. The renewable energy resources include wind energy, solar energy, thermal energy, geothermal energy, we know so many things. So all these energy resources are having uh, several advantages and also they have some disadvantages. Some of them are, uh, in our country we have no problem because we have sun and uh, thermal uh, energy from sun throughout the year, almost throughout the year. So we, we are actually uh, given such advantages but in uh, northern hemisphere and in southern southern hemisphere uh, people are not uh, so uh, fortunate about it because their uh, access to solar energy is very limited and they are, uh, it is available only for a certain period of year which means that one cannot directly depend uh, will be one cannot be directly depending on the uh, solar energy or uh, any other intermittent intermittent renewable energy sources for their uh, total need energy need instead of uh, carbon so uh, what we need is actually an energy storage mechanism. So uh, when we have this renewable energy so uh, sources in, in, in its peak season, we can store that energy and we can use it on demand when it is not available. So one uh, obvious op option for storing energy is uh, going for uh, large grids made up of uh, batteries and supercapacitors. But the main issues with the batteries and supercapacitors are that they are, uh, their capability to store uh, electric energy is very, very minimum, very low, even not even 0.1%. If you compare the amount of energy generated, electric, electric energy generated with the amount of energy that we could store today as per the available technology, it is very, very low. The energy amount of energy you can store with the, all the available lithium batteries and all the available supercapacitors in the world is not even 0.1% that we are generating every day. So this clearly indicates that 
conventional batteries and super capacitors cannot help us storing a large amount of renewable energy uh, derived uh, from photovoltaic cells so we need some other mechanism so for that we have this hydrogen cycle uh, proposing which people are talking a lot about hydrogen economy in which uh, it depends on three uh, main domains one is generating hydrogen and storing hydrogen and consuming the hydrogen the generate the generated hydrogen on demand so these are the three domains that are uh, very important in hydrogen economy in realizing hydrogen economy so uh, of which i have been working on this hydrogen generation technique so uh, i have made clear here that uh, we need a large scale energy storage mechanism and for which the conventional batteries and supercapacitors may not be able to uh, fulfill our need so we need to go for hydrogen cycle hydrogen economy in which what we are going to do is we can harvest energy from a renewable energy source like solar energy through photovoltaics we can use that excess photovoltaic uh, electricity we get from solar uh, energy to split water electrochemically which will produce oxygen and hydrogen we are not going to store oxygen it will be uh, emitted into the environment and we will store only the hydrogen in a hydrogen tank or something and we can export it for other purposes and we can use it in hydrogen combustion engine or in fuel cell to generate again the energy in the form of uh, electricity for domestic uses so when we do this we are again creating water as a by product so which indicates that this cycle will go on forever so uh, we are not uh, uh, we are not in a position to worry about the uh, depletion of resource material unlike the carbon materials because in the case of carbon materials when we com uh, combust them it is going into the environment as co2 it is not coming back to the resource material but in the case of hydrogen we have generated hydrogen from water and when we combust it or combine it electrochemically using a fuel cell it is again giving us water so this is the most promising energy uh, fuel combustion cycle in which the fuel is never going to be depleted at all so this holds a lot of promises for our future and and in the meantime we are also not polluting our environment by emitting uh, co2 uh, yeah so this this process has zero carbon emission so this is why we need hydrogen economy in place of uh, carbon economy so uh, there are several ways of producing uh, hydrogen one is uh, as uh, i said water electrolysis and another one is steam reforming of uh, hydrocarbons uh, and uh, other one method other method is uh, the photoelectrocatalytic water splitting uh, which is very similar to water water electrocatalytic water splitting but uh, with assistance from uh, solar energy so these are the uh, available major three methods and as uh, as of now uh, the current status of hydrogen generation industrial hydrogen generation depends largely on this method which is nothing but the steam reforming of hydrocarbons so uh, because it is uh, relatively cheaper to produce hydrogen by this method when we compare uh, water electrolysis and photoelectrocatalytic water splitting because in this method uh, the process is uh, well uh, uh, tuned and they have um, uh, have now we have the technology to produce hydrogen with a lower cost than than that of water electrolysis but the disadvantages with this uh, method is that it requires high temperature and pressure moreover it is using the hydrocarbon as the hydrogen source which is nothing but the fuel that we get from uh, fossil fuels so uh, we are uh, again going to depend on the same hydrocarbons which is getting depleted rapidly which will not be available in another 50 60 years so this is not going to be a sustainable method for generate hydrogen in the future so obviously we have to switch back to another method which is even though a relatively costlier method which is nothing but the water electrolysis so in this case of water electrolysis what we do is we apply no. potential because water splitting is not a spontaneous reaction which is uh, the free free energy change of uh, which is highly positive so we have to apply a potential to uh, make it happen so which means that we need energy so to split water into hydrogen and uh, when we talk about other methods photocatalytic water splitting is something where we don't apply any uh, potential or electric current all that we have is a z schemes catalyst which which will have a photocathode or a photoanode which will generate their own self bias and which uh, uh, upon uh, requirement of which it may uh, split water and generate hydrogen but 
the rate of hydrogen generation with the photocatalytic water splitting with the zinc catalyst is very low uh, which means that for getting 1 liter of uh, hydrogen with the best active catalyst like uh, say the catalyst is 10% uh, efficient solar to fuel efficient so the, uh, for, for with that with that catalyst you would you would require at least one or two days to get 1 liter of hydrogen so which we don't want to do because hydrogen undoubtedly is going to be the future fuel and you will be requiring hydrogen uh, fuel uh, uh, fuel outlets like we have uh, petrol and diesel outlets like in our country uh, today so uh, we need more amount of hydrogen bulk hydrogen in the purest form and which should be generated from water in a rapid way for which we have uh, only one option which is nothing but water electrolysis so this is the only way there is another method which is uh, known as metal hydrides hy hydrolysis which can produce uh, uh, hydrogen in a rapid way but it cannot produce larger amount of hydrogen moreover we are going to depend on metal hydrides which are highly corrosive and uh, carcinogenic chemicals which will not be environmentally friendly so the uh, best method for hydrogen generation is water electrolysis undoubtedly and that's what i have listed out here because this method does not require high temperature and pressure of course if you apply a high temperature and pressure you can attain a cell, a cell efficiency of as high as 100% and we can use the excess electricity instead of the electricity that we usually use and we we get the highest purity oxygen the purity level will be sorry highest purity hydrogen the purity level will be 99.999% which is not possible with the currently dominating industrial level process which is nothing but the uh, steam reforming of hydrocarbon so uh, as i said earlier the source and combination uh, combustion product are going to be the same water so we will never be uh, running out of the source material so there is no greenhouse gas emission there is no hazardous chemical release and this is the fastest method of all so it is clear that water splitting is going to be a major part going to be playing a major part in the um, hydrogen economy development for the future for the sustainable future so before going into detail i want to explain a few basic things about water splitting uh, in water splitting what we basically do is we are applying uh, a potential electric potential uh, between anode and cathode and we split water molecule into oxygen and hydrogen in which the protons gets discharged protons protons get discharged by taking electron and evolve hydrogen at the cathode which is known as hydrogen evolution reaction which is abbreviated as her and the uh, hydroxide if it is in alkali uh, hydroxide ion gets split in uh, split into uh, oxygen and electron with the evolution of uh, water molecule which is uh, known, as, known as oxygen evolution reaction which occurs at the anode so if you see the free energy change associated with this particular pro process which is very high highly positive positive 237 kilojoule per mole which indicates that this process is not going to be occurring spontaneously yeah it is obvious uh, so we need to apply an additional energy not only that uh, while splitting water into uh, gaseous products uh, liquid water into gaseous oxygen and hydrogen we are actually increasing the entropy of the uh, uh, surrounding so which means that additional energy has to be spent because beyond this uh, free energy determined from thermodynamics aspect so at 25 degree centigrade uh, that means at room temperature we need 1.48 volt to split water so without applying any pressure and temperature so this potential is known as thermo neutral potential of water splitting but if you don't consider the entropy factor we just need 1.23 volt which is uh, solely derived from the uh, free energy change record uh, free energy change record for uh, water splitting so uh, at 1.23 volt clearly no water splitting cannot happen no water splitting can happen so we need additional energy uh, at room temperature which will be uh, uh, adding 250 millivolt of over potential to the uh, reversible over potential creating a thermo neutral over potential so there cannot be any water oxidation catalyst that can perform uh, oer i mean this anodic water oxidation reaction below this potential but there are some exception the catalyst with some uh, uh, three dimensional uh, array with a very high loading and the catalyst with the highest electrochemical surface area these are prone to be uh, showing better activity even with uh, over potential as uh, low as 200 to 190 millivolt so these are all some recent finding so this is what we need to know we need to know from this slide so 
without applying energy you cannot spill water so we need some energy and in that we are going to uh, spend some energy uh, like for uh, the process so uh, we need to lose some energy in the process that's why water splitting is still costlier method than the steam reforming of uh, hydrocarbons so now uh, we also should consider the kinetic effects there when when we see this is a very famous diagram from the paper uh, book chapter from fuel cell science uh, written principally by uh, professor mtm cooper so he uh, illustrated very clearly how uh, the fuel cell reaction hydrogen oxidation and oxygen reduction and the water electrolysis water electrolysis reaction hydrogen water oxidation and hydrogen evolution will will be having kinetics in solution so uh, what we can see from here is that the hydrogen evolution reaction and the hydrogen oxidation reaction which are kinetically so facile because they don't require the catalytic catalytic sites to undergo any sort of oxidation reduction before the reaction is occurring so which means that their equilibrium potential and thermoneutral potential are going to be the same and moreover they exactly intersect at the reversible potential because of its facile kinetics so this is clear that hydrogen evolution reaction is not going to be a, a big threat for uh, losing energy in water electrolysis but the real uh, culprit is here uh, the uh, oxygen evolution reaction at the anode so unlike hydrogen oxidation and hydrogen uh, evolution the water oxidation reaction and oxygen reduction reaction they do not intersect at their uh, reversible over potential they always require additional over potential which is about 250 millivolt because of the entropy factor and that's why we have to lose an additional energy while we split water so when we generated hydrogen by uh, spending this much additional energy so when you are again combining it in a fuel cell you are going to spend additional energy so totally you will be losing uh, uh, around 500 millivolt in uh, cell voltage so which means that we are losing a lot of energy so this is not an energy efficient process so that's why people are uh, carrying out so much work on both overr catalyst as well as on water oxidation catalyst to reduce this over potential as close as possible to 1.23 volt by which we can make this process energy efficient and also cost efficient so this is the aim of overall water splitting thing so before going to uh, other details i would like to show the difference between water electrolysis and electrocatalytic water splitting so it may seem uh, the same but it, they are not actually for water electrolysis in youtube you can uh, get so many videos this is one of the video i get uh, from uh, youtube and uh, you can see uh, this guy has uh, yeah yeah i'll just mute it uh, this guy has uh, inserted two pins uh, which is nothing but made up of stainless steel under a cup and he is having a alkaline battery with, with which the, uh, the anode and cathode things are there and he just put it over there so that he is making an electrical connection so when he pour water into that in that one you can actually see the evolution of oxygen and hydrogen where you see more bubbles this side in this electrode so this is nothing but the hydrogen and where you see less uh, bubbles this is nothing but the oxygen because in water splitting we have when you split water you can actually get half mole of oxygen for one mole of hydrogen which means that the amount of gas collected will be 2 is to 1 ratio for hydrogen to oxygen so this is basically the uh, water electrolysis so this is what uh, water electrolysis means so this is how it, it has been performed but if you see electrocatalytic water splitting it is totally different from water electrolysis because this guy as we noted here he has just taken two stainless steel pins and pour some water in a cup and he is connecting an alkaline battery of uh, high uh, energy density with the cell voltage of uh, 9 volt so this is totally uh, Uh, unacceptable in in terms of uh, engineering aspect because engineers always wanted to reduce the processing uh, uh, processing charge in terms of energy efficiency and cost efficiency so we cannot do uh, water splitting like this so this is just to show how water water electrolysis works so as you can see from here that uh, hydrogen compartment is two times in volume and uh, yeah oxygen compartment is half of that so in the case of electrocatalytic water splitting what we do is we we do not apply randomly a high potential like 9 volt just as he did we apply a specific actually needed potential or current and we avoid excess energy loss and we optimize catalyst composition we also play a lot among 
work function of the catalyst bonding and energy of interaction and by doing this we are ensuring energy and cost efficiency even then we are currently unable to beat the currently dominating industrial process steam reforming of uh, hydrocarbon so uh, much work are uh, anticipated to be done on this field so which can produce wonder in uh, catalyst design which could us uh, which could help us to make uh, out performing ca catalyst which can ensure this cost and energy efficiency so yeah so let's move on to catalyst section so i have uh, i think i have made it clear uh, why uh, we need to go for hydrogen and uh, for hydrogen generation what are the methods we have seen and among those methods why water splitting is superior and in water splitting what are the uh, disadvantages we have and what are the things we can do i i have shown all this thing and we also seen the difference between water electrolysis and electrocatalytic water splitting so these are the uh, things th that we have so far seen so th from this slide onwards i will be presenting about the developments that has occurred in the recent past uh, i mean in the last 10 years the past decade so uh, currently trending catalyst uh, as per recent literature are metal phosphides metal chalcogenides metal oxides hydroxides layer double hydroxide and hydro hydro structure catalyst so we'll be uh, looking into all types of catalyst uh, mainly our work what we have done in our laboratory and i'll be explaining what are the uh, new things that we have done with that material and what are the advancement we made and what are the new knowledge that we added to the field with the, with all this material so this is what we are going to uh, basically see but before going into that one we can uh, have a look at this periodic table we have more than uh, more than one, one eight, one, more than one, 100 elements and among which we have only very few metals which can catalyze this uh, water oxidation and water reduction reaction efficiently efficiently means with uh, very less energy loss so among them uh, the very first metal uh, tested for water electrolysis was pt uh, people have tried using pt as both cathode as well as anode and they found that pt is not a good electrode material for splitting uh, water as an anode and they moved to iridium and ruthenium these three metal ruthenium iridium and pt these three metal have been ruling this field of water electrolysis or i can say electrocatalytic water splitting for more than three decades and people have never moved out of this uh, three three metals and they stick around these three metals making uh, iridium ruthenium composite pt iridium composite pt ruthenium composite and uh, making this uh, uh, oxides of uh, ruthenium and iridium with other uh, metalloids like uh, antimony tin tellurium like this they have played so many things around these three metals only for at least three decades from 1980s so there was no big improvement uh, on this field uh, until people have uh, tried improving the activity of these three metals the main problem with these three metals are pt is noble and expensive we know iridium and ruthenium are they are scarce metal they their abundance is very very low in their yes. so, so when we are well, we have now realized that we are going to be depending fully on hydrogen in our future for a sustainable energy system so in that case we cannot depend on the metals ruthenium and iridium which is available in a very 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 low amount in our earth crust so which is uh, a big burden on uh, uh, on water, water electrolysis because which, which has been uh, realized as the most promising method for the purest hydrogen generation in a faster way but it is being retarded by the fact that the material which can catalyze water oxidation reaction are scarce in nature so we have to go beyond that one so that's why people have come up with non precious metals which are also uh, which are also efficient but not as efficient as ruthenium and iridium in acidic condition because of their solubility so people have tried creating alkaline water electrolysis and so i will be talking about uh, that part later so we'll uh, see one by one so before going into catalyst uh, in detail so i'll like to show this slide i show this slide in uh, every uh, each of my presentation so uh, it would be easier for you to follow uh, the things i say in my upcoming slides so every electrocatalyst is to be characterized for three things mainly one is activity and selectivity and also the stability these three 
these three factors are 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 the ones which make an electrocatalyst applicable for um, uh, water splitting electro water splitting electrocatalysis for uh, a long term operation so if you have a catalyst which can have high activity but not good selectivity and stability that cannot be used the same is applicable to all other catalysts so a good electrocatalyst should have high activity high selectivity and high stability so how we can determine uh, the electrocatalyst is having a high activity and stability selectivity and so on so we have been given a set of um, electro electro analytical parameters which can be obtained with simple electro analytical techniques like cyclic voltmetry linear sweep voltmetry chronometry chronopotentiometry and uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy also, of course so uh, what we are going to do is the activity is usually measured as over potential at a defined current density the current density can be uh, anything that can be normalized by area geometrical area of the electrode or the mass of the electrode material or it can be specific activity specific activity is nothing but when you normalize the observed current with the actual surface area which can be uh, bet surface area or electrochemical surface area or specific surface area uh, specific uh, specific surface area determined by any other method but the most accurate one will be the specific activity which is uh, normalized with electrochemical surface area so these are all uh, uh, physical chemistry things so uh, yeah i i hope you follow and we have tefl analysis which is very important in all electro catalysis uh, electrocatalytic studies which gives us uh, information on the mechanism by which the reaction is happening and we also get the ability of the material to carry out the reaction at uh, reversible potential i mean at zero over potential which is uh, termed in uh, exchange current density and there is another factor uh, which is also used to determine the activity turnover frequency which is nothing but the rate at which the desired product is formed on the electrode surface in our case it is oxygen and hydrogen so turnover frequency is also going to be telling about how active your material is so these three uh, parameters are uh, actually telling about the activity of an electrocatalyst and the faradaic efficiency is the only parameter parameter we have uh, which will be uh, telling about the selectivity of an electrocatalyst and we have uh, two different op option for uh, testing stability under accelerated degradation condition where the electrode material is uh, where the electro material is actually set at very high current density and the hydrogen generation is uh, quantified but in the case of uh, prolonged galvanostatic and potential static electrolysis they perform this test usually at relatively lower current density or lower over potential to show that their catalyst is stable enough to be promoted for long term operation in uh, real commercial scale water electrolysis so this is the thing that we know so uh, i will be talking uh, much about over potential uh, tefl slope and uh, these things in upcoming slides so please catch up with me whenever i say over potential tefl slope and turnover frequency i am talking about activity whenever i say faradaic efficiency i am talking about selectivity whenever i say chronometry and chronopotentiometry i am talking about stability yes Yeah. Let's move on to metal salcogenides. Metal salcogenides are uh, uh, known to be ca ca catalyzing hydrogen evolution reaction in alkali, uh, even in the 90s. Uh, some metals like nickel, copper, cobalt, and these metals have been reported to be catalyzing uh, hydrogen evolution reaction in the alkali, but not in acid in those days because people knew that uh, the salcogenides of these metals, nickel, cobalt, copper, and iron. and these metals are uh, unstable in acid uh, like i mean in ph 0 but uh, very recent finding shows that these materials can be stable if you have reductive potential uh, reductive atmosphere which means that if your electrode material is uh, always kept under cathodic condition this material can be stable so uh, these material are, are also used for hydrogen evolution reaction in acid recently so whenever i am speaking about the chalcogenides i am talking about these three and i have sulfide selenide telluride in the case of sulfide and selenide telluride we can have two different anions with in combination with this material one could be uh, disulfide dianion uh, we, we know s2 to minus and uh, disulf uh, diselenide dianion and tidelluride uh, dianion so this dianions will form pyrite type uh, salcogenides with this metals and they are also proven to be highly efficient for uh, hydrogen evolution reaction 
in the case when we have uh, just a uh, anion uh, divalent uh, negative uh, anion so s2 minus se2 minus p2 minus in that case we will have a simple binary chalcogenic with this metal and we will have good uh, electrocatalytic activity so so far in literature these three uh, metals fe cobalt nickel are highly reported with this uh, chalcogens but in addition very recent reports suggest that copper palladium and uh, these two also can be uh, used uh, as a hr electrocatalyst when it is combined with this chalcogens apart from this there are a set of uh, classic materials known as uh, layered materials layered 2d materials which are uh, basically the sulfides and tel uh, selenides tellurides of tungsten and molybdenum tungsten and molybdenum which also uh, have been uh, intensively investigated for hydrogen evolution reaction specifically hydrogen evolution reaction if you just type uh, mos2 for hcr in google you will get uh, thousands of literature so this material mos2 mos2 and uh, tungsten sulfide sulfide these are all well studied materials so these development had happened very recently i mean in the last decade so uh, we have also done a few works on that uh, area so i will be talking about the key catalysts that we have uh, developed in our laboratory and what are the advancement we made in the field and uh, how it uh, promoted the field for that so the very first thing uh, i will be introducing is my favorite catalyst nickel selenide i have done so many work uh, to this catalyst nickel selenide is uh, chalcogenide of nickel uh, which is conventionally prepared uh, by taking a nickel precursor and uh, uh, from mixing it with the selenium precursor and hydrothermally treating at high temperature or it can be uh, generated or grown on nickel foam substrate like i, sh I have shown here directly by taking a nickel precursor uh, sorry selenium precursors like uh, sodium hydrogen selenide uh, either hydrothermal method or you can just take uh, selenium powder and uh, place it near nickel foam in a in a atmosphere and heat it uh, like 350 to 450 degrees centigrade for 2 to 3 hours you can get selenization on nickel foam but all this method required either high temperature or a high pressure so before we uh, reported this study there is no method available for the generation of nickel selenide uh, on nickel foam because people are uh, very curious about this nickel foam because it is uh, 3d in structure which means high surface area is possible so when you selenize this material you will get nickel selenide over the surface of nickel which has direct atomic level bonding so that there will be no issue of uh, uh, issue of conductivity and we don't need any binder to stick the material so this particular electrode Uh, had several advantages in uh, water splitting electrocatalysis so what we look into the um, uh, what we had looked into this material was so this selenium uh, sorry nickel foam was selenized using either hydrothermal method or uh, high temperature annealing method so we uh, believe that the selenization in hydrothermal begins uh, in the uh, very first uh, in the very first few minutes so Uh, it is not necessary to keep the uh, reaction co components uh, at the same uh, high temperature and pressure for a very longer period of time so what we did was we took uh, nickel foam uh, pieces of nickel foam with nahsc and we have irradiated with the microwave with the simple microwave oven that we usually have in our home for 3 minutes just for 3 minutes so uh, this is what we done and we have uh, turned the microwave oven off and we let the reaction mixture to be uh, in the same oven without applying any microwave and uh, we left it for aging for 5 hours and we found uh, clear selenization of nickel which resulted in ni3se4 formation so this was the very first method where the selenization of nickel was realized without applying very high temperature or requiring an inert atmosphere or a hydrothermal vessel so this is adv advancement we made and Uh, all other previous reports were uh, very curious about ex examining the hcr and oer activity of this material in alkali or either in acid under uh, cathodic condition only for hcr but we uh, knew that this material could also be handy in catalyzing uh, oer and hcr in neutral condition also i mean in ph7 which is very important when we consider the solar hydrogen generation devices because those devices require 
uh, catalyst which can perform better at neutral and near neutral water so we uh, applied this material for a near near uh, neutral water splitting also and we found very good activity with this material as you can see with the ph increases uh, towards high alkaline condition the oer over potential decreases and the same is true for hr and in the, in the case of ph7 we still have high uh, hr current density and in the case of oer uh, oer is slightly sluggish but even it is better than the best catalyst rio2 and also better than nickel foam so this is the advancement we made uh, we uh, have first time shown uh, with this report that nickel selenide can be prepared without uh, a requirement of hydrothermal vessel or uh, high temperature annealing so we extended a uh, similar approach to uh, tellurization but we failed actually we did not observe any tellurization it is because uh, of two reason one is that uh, tellurium is not uh, as uh, oxidizing as uh, selenium and second is that the nucleus nucleation of the nickel telluride does not happen at uh, very low temperature like uh, the one happened at uh, uh, 3 minutes microwave irradiation so we had to go for uh, hydrothermal reaction with no option but we uh, did one more thing here what we saw that was before this work the hydrogen uh, sorry tellurization of nickel foam was done uh, only with the precursor nahd which is derived by dissolving tellurium powder in sodium borohydride at elevated temperature so this is the precursor we usually get but the problem with this precursor was when you generate uh, sodium hydrogen telluride by dissolving tellurium powder in sodium borohydride you also will be having some impurities unwanted impurities like uh, boric uh, acid bo boh thrice and uh, the axion ion of boric acid and some salt in that one so this is not good for an electrocatalyst and uh, so what do you if you avoid this uh, unwanted impurities in hydrogen uh, sodium hydrogen uh, hydrogen telluride generation so that's what we did we actually uh, changed the reducing agent uh, from nabh4 to hydrazine hydrate which is uh, which is having uh, several advantages over sodium borohydride because when you use sodium borohydride you will be leaving residues of sodium and boron in solution but when you uh, use hydra hydrazine it will not leave any residues because the product uh, product of this reaction will be just nitrogen gas which will escape out from the solution so you are not basically leaving any impurities back in your solution or in your uh, brown material so uh, this is the advantages we have with the uh, hydrazin hydrate and we subjected nickel foam for tellurization with both this material and we found that at 180 degree centigrade 2 hours the tellurization was successful so with only uh, tellurium metal powder there, there was no actually tellurization so we need reducing agent and we need 180 degree centigrade and we need at least 2 hour for tellurization but uh, an interesting thing was that when we changed the precursor there was change in uh, morphology of the material form as you can see here this are uh, this looks just like a flex and this looks like a, a coral uh, uh, reef uh, but when we have nht sorry uh, h2t generated from hydrazine hydrate we had nice uh, nano wire like structure and this is completely free of impurities of uh, sodium and boron so as a result when we uh, examined the hydrogen evolution reaction in acid ph0 and ph14 in alkali we uh, ended up getting higher current density with this one which has no impurity of sodium and boron so this is the new thing that we showed here uh, when you have hydrogen hydrate in place of sodium borohydride for tellurization you will be having better catalyst which will be performing better in electrocatalysis which also showed good stability in both cycling condition as well as in chrono chrono amperometric condition sorry chrono potentiometry condition yeah so uh, then uh, as we have uh, become uh, very familiar about uh, selenizing and tellurizing metal precursors we uh, switched the precursor from nickel to copper and we selenized it in this case we uh, again took sodium hydrogen selenide and uh, we selenized uh, copper in two different way so the main difference between selenizing copper and nickel is that Uh, copper can be easily selenized because its uh, ele ele uh, standard ele redox potential is very higher than uh, nickel which means that the oxidation of which may not be as tedious as that of uh, 
nickel because nickel is more reducing than copper so um, we all we need is that just a 20 minutes stirring at a slightly elevated temperature with nhsc we don't need any hydrothermal and we, you can have a very nice morphology of copper selenide cupsc but you can of course uh, selenize copper by a hydrothermal method and we set a uh, 60 minutes in this case the uh, slightly higher temperature we ended up uh, having spike heat hearts and we confirmed from all this experiment that selenization has occurred and we found that this method the hydrothermal method uh, leads to uh, the formation of thicker uh, cu2 se uh, layer over copper foam so which added a uh, higher intrinsic resistance so that's why the current density what you observe is very low uh, relatively very low when compared to the one uh, obtained in this method but when you perform iron rub compensation you can see they, their activity almost overlaps on one another this is indicating that the activity of cu2 sc both uh, both honeycomb ra and spike rods remain the same uh, but the difference what, what we observe here is mainly due to the intrinsic resistance uh, that is increased as a result of extended reaction time so what we have shown from this is that for selenizing copper you you don't need a higher uh, reaction time you just need a very uh, little time as 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 low as 20 minutes so in, in one more thing that in this study uh, we shown was the reduction in the uh, over potential of uh, hydrogen over potential of copper so before selenizing the hydrogen evolution onset was somewhere here and after selenizing it is reduced to this over potential almost one volt reduction in the over potential so uh, such a selenization uh, was never uh, observed uh, to be lowering hydrogen evolution over potential to such a greater extent of one volt so this was the first time and this article was even featured in the cover image and uh, so far i have shown how we have made some uh, unsupported self grown self standing uh, chalcogenides nickel and copper chalcogenides on their respective metal foam substrates and in this work uh, what we have done is we made some colloidal catalyst in this case we have not uh, taken any uh, metal uh, substrate for uh, growing the material instead we took a soft template which is nothing but the dna of a herring uh, fish fox sperm so uh, we took this dna in a particular concentration and mixed with nickel acetate and we obtained uh, such a self assembly of nickel 2 plus uh, through classical coordination chemistry which can be uh, further treated with nr2s to form nickel sulfide so this is how we obtained nickel sulfide over the chains of nickel uh, sorry dna and what you see here is actually the tem image of the same and this is a bunch of dna chain over which the dark particulates what you see are nickel sulfide so when we measured the oxygen evolution reaction of this material we found this is how this have delivered very good activity at 10 milliampere even it has parallel activity to that of the best catalyst or you want and this was the first time uh, we observed such a high activity with the almost 200 times lower nickel quantity and a similar approach was extended to uh, make cobalt sulfide dna where we have obtained interesting morphologies for which we still don't know the reasons but this material still delivered better activity and you can see the over potential for uh, nickel sulfide and cobalt sulfide is almost the same for 10 milliampere and these two material have delivered this activity I remember uh, that with 200 times lower metal loading so the main thing that we achieved with this strategy strategy is that you actually don't need a higher amount of metal you need very very minimum amount of metal provided that you have a good substrate like dna but the problem with this material is that dna is not highly stable in uh, water oxidation condition so they it can uh, undergo degradation so it may need uh, uh, the assistance of further uh, binding agents like uh, nephion or uh, pvp uh, we are still working on that we, we hope that this can be improved further and yeah. so uh, this is about the tungsten sulfide which was uh, tungsten sulfide quantum dots which was generated by electrochemical swapping uh, i will first explain what is electrochemical swapping uh, swapping is uh, actually for uh, uh, fancy thing uh, we make a uh, electrode of wsto bulk material which is having clear diffraction patterns as i have shown here which will be used as a working electrode and we will connect it with the uh, 
counter electrode which is usually platinum and uh, we have taken a nano coarse electrolyte in which uh, high potential more than 2 volt was applied for overnight during which the working electrode ws to bulk electrode disintegrated and dissolved into the dispersed into the solution the nano coarse solution with a uh, particle size uh, of lower than 2 nanometer so we have uh, obtained a clear ws to quantum dots which had a particle size 2 to 3 nanometer majorly and we also observed a drastic decrease in over potential as you can see ws to bulk is having very low activity but when we have quantum dots the current density is very high and we also uh, realized very low charge transfer resistance when we have this electrochemically chopped ws to quantum dots so these are the metal salcogenides uh, which are uh, uh, being studied by various researcher and these are the few works that we have done in our lab and uh, these are the advancement advancement we made with uh, metal salcogenides and uh, having worked with nickel selenide uh, for a very long time we have been wondering uh, we have been wondering what could be the role of uh, stoichiometry of nickel selenide on hcr and oer activity uh -huh. so what we did was we prepared nickel selenide stoichiometrically different nickel selenide and we uh, evaluated its hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution reaction uh, activity in alkali we found that in hydrogen evolution reaction the selenium to nickel ratio is very crucial when we have very high ratio of selenium the activity is always higher which means that the selenium which is more electronegative than nickel is acting as the uh, hub for uh, proton uh, absor absor absorption which is always leading to uh, uh, relatively higher amount of reduction so obviously we have higher current density in the case of nickel uh, selenide catalyzed oer we found a strange thing that the selenium to nickel ratio doesn't matter at all but the oxidation of nickel uh, the potential at which the oxidation of nickel occurs matters because when we have very low uh, potential of oxidation for nickel the current density is always higher when we have higher oxidation of uh, oxidation potential for nickel the current density is very low so this is how Uh, the stoichiometry of nickel selenide affects the oer and hcr activity of nickel selenides so uh, sorry uh, okay uh, this is actually metal phosphate sorry uh, so uh, so far i have been talking about the uh, salcogenides metal salcogenides and now we have metal phosphates uh, like i have said earlier uh, the same material are combined with phosphate to make good electrocatalyst Uh, but the problem with phosphides are that phosphide uh, making phosphide materials is very uh, tedious process even it is highly dangerous it, it may cause potential explosion if you don't uh, make uh, essential precautions so uh, this was the main problem with uh, phosphide material and what we did was uh, we we had this feeling that this can be simplified this method can be simplified because there is no open air method for making cobalt phosphide or any other metal phosphide before this report was published so in this method what we done was what we have done was we took cobalt and uh, cobalt precursor and uh, a phosphide precursor which is nothing but sodium hypophosphite and mixed it in a, a molar ratio of 1 is to 3 in the solvent of ethanol and water and we just dried it up upon stirring so it, it resulted in a uh, mass brown color mass which was annealed at 450 degrees centigrade that resulted in a clearly hydrostructure catalyst in which there was an amorphous cobalt phosphate layer which was later uh, confirmed by various techniques and a crystalline co3 o4 core spinal uh, cobalt oxide uh, core this material delivered very good activity and it has even outperformed all commercially available catalysts like spinal co3 o4 nickel oxide ruthenium oxide which were which were per, uh, procured from sigma aldrich and so far this is the best activity best activity of cobalt catalyst when the, the catalyst was reported for oer and we have seen uh, the retention of morphology even after several hours of operation and this report shows that if you have a hydrostructures of amorphous uh, cobalt phosphate with a crystalline oxide shell the activity will always be better and this method is not only producing metal phosphate and also creating a coarse structure which is not known earlier so oh, yeah sorry i forgot to change this slide i'm extremely sorry so now we'll be seeing about uh, the oxides and hydroxides uh, oxides and hydroxides are uh, actually uh, relatively higher in number when we consider the number of metal reported for 
so in in earlier cases i was telling only about these metals but in the case of oxides and hydroxide we also have vanadium oxide hydroxide titanium oxide which have uh, which have been reported for hcr and uh, oer activity and uh, i will be talking about few things that we have done in our lab and the very first work uh, we have done in our lab was uh, uh, synthesis of nickel hydroxide uh, microfluorides um, obviously the hydrothermal method and we found that uh, this nickel hydroxide when we uh, examined for the very first cycle it showed very poor activity but out of curiosity we cycled the material and during which we noticed increase in electrochemical accessibility of nickel and also increase in oer current density for which we found that this material is getting activated by forming nickel oxy hydroxide and uh, the same is attributed to the absorbed enhancement and this material also showed very good stability for over uh, 1600 minutes uh, which is relatively higher so uh, as we know that uh, cobalt hydroxide will also have uh, good activity instead of making cobalt hydroxide we uh, did a uh, change in the catalyst design what we did was we initially made cobalt pt uh, with a very known uh, pvp method and we added sodium borohydride to uh, produce cobalt pt if you stop the reaction at this condition this material will remain as cobalt pt but what we did was we stopped the uh, nitrogen purging so we uh, intentionally let the material to undergo oxidation which formed a cobalt hydroxide sheet decorated with cobalt pt particle as you can see here the thin sheet what you are seeing here is cobalt hydroxide and the fine particles are cobalt pt and the same is confirmed from other experiments uh, and when we see the activity difference it is huge when you have cobalt the ore potential is relatively higher more than 50 millivolt when you have this hydrostructure catalyst the ore potential is very high the same is true for hcr also and one more thing that i did not show the data here one more thing was that this material is magnetic so we wanted to use uh, the magnetic characteristic of this material uh, to be helpful in water splitting electrocatalyst what we did was instead of uh, coating this material on a conventional substrate electrode we coated this material on a magnetic substrate which doesn't have any intrinsic electrocatalytic activity then we kept that uh, 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 we, we kept that electrode uh, which, which is modified with this material in solution for more than 7 days in the same solution and we found that the activity is retained even after 7 days of aging so we showed uh, with this result that magnetic property of an electrocatalyst can be uh, useful in improving the lifetime of electrocatalytic material in water electrolysis then we have uh, gone for another uh, hydrostructure electrocatalyst in which in which we used uh, nickel iron ldh the best oer catalyst in alkali with pt nanoparticle which is the best hcr catalyst obviously so our aim was to combine these two best catalysts in the same material so that we can uh, lower the processing charge uh, and we can increase the cost efficiency as expected in oer the platinum content did not affect the oer activity but uh, as you can see in, in lower amount uh, but in the case of uh, hcr the nafldh had shown very good activity when compared to even uh, the commercial catalyst of 28% ptc pt in carbon matrix but we, uh, when we increase the platinum content we notice that the hcr over potential increased almost linearly with increasing amount as expected but the oer over potential did not show any regular uh, trend in over potential until we reached 90 millimole 90 millimole of platinum acid chloroplatinic acid concentration we did not observe any significant change in the oer over potential but suddenly we uh, began to realize there is significant lowering in oer over potential which got improved even with the higher amount of pt which was attributed to the higher electronegativity of uh, pt which which has been shown to increase the electrocatalytic activity of nife cobalt even cobalt this effect was also observed with gold by some people earlier so these are the things the uh, non precious metal catalyst uh, that we have done for water splitting electrocatalysis in our lab and now i i i will be talking about noble metal dilution i said in my uh, earlier slides that uh, for uh, at least for three decades this field water splitting electrocatalysis for hydrogen generation was dominated mainly by these three metals but 
this metal is expensive and noble these two metals are precious and they are uh, available in a very low amount in our reserves so what are the ways that we can still use this material as they are highly efficient for water splitting but without worrying about their scarcity one way is that making them uh, uh, instead of using the this material as a bulk electrode like pt foil or iridium foil or ruthenium foil why don't we use nanoparticle so we have uh, now access to generating various method of creating fine nanoparticles with very low amount of catalyst which could deliver even better activity than bulk electrode so that was the aim so we took the same dna metallization strategy which we used for nickel sulfurization and cobalt sulfurization in which we took aqueous dna the same dna which is obtained from the fish foam and we mixed with the iridium and platinum salt and still took that to make homogeneous solution and in the case of pt we added nabh4 as you can see Uh, so in the case of pt we added nabh4 and in the case of iridium also we added nabh4 but the difference between these two synthesis was that you can reduce iridium uh, 3 plus into iridium initially when you immediately added nabh4 but that is not stable in aqueous solution when uh, when the ph is higher than 8.9 so it uh, spontaneously get oxidized to iro2 nanoparticles so this was the observation we made Be- before oxidation the solution was brown in color and after oxidation it turned the characteristic iro2 nanoparticle color which gets intensified with the higher concentration of dna so this is how we created uh, iridium oxide uh, dna molecular self assembly and by this method uh, by the same method we created pt dna uh, molecular self assembly in this case even uh, with a higher uh, ph pt does not get oxidized as it is a noble metal and we also proved that uh, for uh, generating a stable colloidal solution of this catalyst dna is must when you don't have dna you just have pt and bh4 it will form pt particle but it will get settled after 2 uh, hours because of coagulation and agglomeration as you know when you don't have uh, a specific support material the nanoparticles will collapse so this is how we uh, made this thing and uh, applied to oer with iro2 in alkali we obtained the, one of the lowest over potential for oer in alkali with iro2 with a very very low loading of 17 microgram please hear carefully just 17 microgram per centimeter square because all other report wherever the iridium oxide or ruthenium oxide have been used for oer have used this material in a loading of 1 to 2 milligram per centimeter square 1 to 2 milligram 1 milligram of iro2 is more than 1 lakh in our currency in indian currency so how can we afford it just for a simple water splitting 1 mg per simple electrode which is ca- costlier than 1 lakh so this is not a good way but when we have just 17 microgram the cost of the electrode is very much lower which will be hugely impacting the amount of sorry the cost of production of hydrogen so this is the adv- advantages uh, this is the advantage we made with this thing and the same is also observed to be highly stable in this material this this material uh, delivered this activity more than 12 hours the same current density as you can see the, the pt dna even after 500 uh, 5000 cycles of uh, hcr and even after 24 hours of hcr in chromatic chromatic condition the activity remains the same you, you cannot actually uh, see any difference in activity so this material have not only be- delivered better activity than the commercial catalyst which have higher loading they deliver this activity which more than 200 times lower metal loading so this is what we call diluting noble metals so this is a, a novel approach which has never been shown in literature and these two uh, have been uh, reported very recently by our group so uh, i have so far been uh, talking about the catalyst and development types of catalyst and i have given so many examples now i will talk about uh, the oer uh, catalyst of non hydroxide and non oxide metal so uh, we know for cat- catalyzing oer a metal or metal center need to undergo oxidation and reduction in a cycle which means that if you have a non oxide hydroxide oer catalyst like um, nickel salcogenides like nickel sulfide nickel selenide whatever the material i have shown and whatever been applied to oer so they all are really oer catalyst or they are just pre catalyst this was the question so people have dig into this question uh, more and more recently and they found a wonderful thing because those materials are not actually catalyst they are just pre catalyst they act as, as the pre catalyst 
and they generate actually oxygen evolving oxide hydroxide and hydroxide upon oer in alkali so all this non oxide hydroxide catalyst undergo anion exchange and even under reductive potential and uh, such an anion exchange is accelerated when we have anodic potential so when we have uh, anion exchange we we must have structural reorganization so we should see this thing and when we have structural reorganization the accessibility of metal site should increase so these are the recent comprehension about uh, non oxide hydroxide uh, electrocatalyst and i will show a few example here and this is a very famous report by uh, stern et al who prepared uh, nickel phosphide uh, material when they applied this material for oer they observed uh, clear structural reorganization as you can see here this nickel phosphide exchanged anion and formed nickel oxide so this material had shown better activity than nickel hydroxide because of having two things one is a metallic nickel phosphide which is highly conductive uh, oer active nickel oxide which is having direct atomic level bonding with conductive nickel phosphide so this heterostructure helped them uh, to realize highest activity they confirm the presence of nickel oxygen and phosphide phosphide together as you can see here on the edges you can see oxygen but the phosphide is seen only in the core so it is clear that this non oxide catalyst like phosphides selenides sulfides they undergo structural reorganization at the surface exchanging anions and in another report another report related report fock et al uh, says that it it not only happens uh, with just anion exchange there is also oxidation of anion and uh, the same was later uh, proven by fang et al as you can see here before uh, oer the oxygen uh, elemental map shows a very little distribution but after oer as you can see wherever selenium were there and you can see oxygen everywhere so this indicate that there is not only anion exchange there is not only uh, structural reorganization there is also uh, anion oxidation so we have uh, discussed this topic uh, in detail uh, in our recent review if you are interested in knowing about this phenomena of non oxide hydroxide catalyst in oer you can refer this article and i would like to go further from here so uh, having uh, understood that the anion oxidation could lead to uh, increased uh, increased accessibility of metal sites we uh, intentionally prepared a material called coseo3 cobalt selenide cobalt selenide in which we have uh, seo3 two minus anion instead of conventional se2 minus anion so as a result we have achieved a better activity than just cobalt selenide which is mainly because of the increased electrochemical accessibility of cobalt as you can see here cobalt is having very low uh, area under peak but when you have cobalt selenide area under peak for the same loading of catalyst is very very high this is clearly indicating that when the anion is oxidized and uh, chemically or electrochemically the electrochemical accessibility for the metal sites increases which also increases the activity so this is uh, one of the things that we have done recently understanding that non oxide hydroxide catalysts are uh, actually not true catalyst for oer they are pre catalyst so uh, when we cycle this material so to see whether the increased electrochemical accessibility is retained uh, after after a few number of significant cycle and we saw, we have uh, said that the electrochemical accessibility remain almost the double of unoxidized cobalt selenide as you can see from the uh, charge under area Uh, under peak area and the electrochemical accessibility re uh, remains almost twice that of cobalt selenide and the electrochemical surface area determined from cv shows uh, almost double the amount of true cdl value indicating that oxidizing anion intentionally will actually benefit uh, oer electrocatalysis by increasing the electrochemical accessibility which also lowered the free energy for oer activation sorry we are activation energy of cobalt sites so uh, so far i have been talking about uh, the electrocatalytic reactions of uh, water splitting uh, oxidation and reduction i have shown this thing that noble metals and metal oxide have been ruling uh, this field for more than 3 decades and the recent evolution of 
nanostructured materials, particularly of these metals, has improved alkaline water splitting, but Vt uh, remained poor alkaline uh, HCR electrode. But the phosphide and selenides uh, improved the HCR activity. Even some metals like uh, ruthenium and rhodium, when combined with the metal hydroxides of this metal, show better activity than PET for HCR in uh, alkali. But uh, one important thing is that the acidic water oxidation is still dominated by IRO2 and RO2. There is no better catalyst than these two materials. So many work, ha many has to work on this particular area to come up with non precious at the same time stable and efficient electrocatalyst for acidic water oxidation. So if you are interested in knowing more about the developments, you can uh, open these articles. So I will be now moving to the second part of the talk. So I have been feeling so far that water splitting is must for hydrogen generation. So is there something that we can do beyond hydrogen generation with water splitting? Yes, of course we can. So for understanding that, we need to first grasp uh, the ways in which water can be oxidized. So Water can be oxidized in various ways. As you can see here, I have listed. Uh, you can uh, oxidize water, uh, taking up four electron and four proton. You can evolve oxygen, which has, which I have been talking for, uh, for, for so long. And you can oxidize water by taking just three electron and three proton. You can form super hydroperoxide radical, which is uh, when you have uh, an anion, it can be uh, superoxide anion or you can just uh, stop the reaction with just two proton, two electron uh, withdrawal, which will give you hydrogen peroxide. So when you uh, take out only one proton and one electron from a single water molecule, you will have hydroxyl radical. So beyond oxygen, which is actually not used in water electrolysis, you can generate superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radical. But when we uh, see the possibility and uh, possibility of generating these other products, which are actually uh, quite useful in industrial bleaching, wastewater treatment, and uh, uh, scavenging as antioxidants. So this could be very useful, more than oxygen evolution reaction, because oxygen evolution reaction is used just for hydrogen generation. But when we have hydrogen peroxide, we all know hydrogen peroxide is a wonderful reagent, uh, which is the greenest oxidizing agent, which does not produce any harmful material uh, like uh, hypochlorites upon you uh, upon its use so uh, we can access a safe passage for the production of hydrogen peroxide just by controlling the number of protons and electron transferred in water oxidation reaction and also we have this hydro hydroxyl radical which is highly oxidizing so this can be used to, to treat water wastewater and uh, uh, dye polluted waters and so many other things because this is highly oxidizing because the oxidation potential of hydroxy radical is 2.3 volt, which is quite high. So it, it can be used for treating so many other things. So this is, these are the things that we can do beyond just hydrogen generation from water splitting. In upcoming slides, I will be mainly talking about hydrogen peroxide generation. But before that, I would like to stress a few things here. Uh, along this reaction, you can notice that I have listed the associated redox potential. Uh, I can say uh, the reversible potential or equilibrium potential. For four electron, four proton transfer, you have 1.229, which is nothing but a simple water oxidation reaction. But when you reduce the number of electron transfer, number of electrons and proton transfer, you will have to apply higher potential, which means that when you apply a potential and when you go from a lower potential to higher potential, you will have higher probability for uh, encountering this reaction and very high probability for encountering this reaction, uh, the probability will keep on reducing. But we can do something here. Uh, if you uh, play with some material which are poor for this reaction and this reaction and selective for this reaction, you can use that material for exclusively for hydrogen peroxide production to water oxidation. And if you have some material which is exclusive for one electron, one proton oxidation, you can use that material for wastewater treatment, primary uh, effluent treatment and dye polluted water treatment. So uh, it all depends on the material that you are going to use. So in the upcoming session, I'll be talking about uh, the electrochemical anodic synthesis of hydrogen peroxide and what is the current trend and how we can achieve this thing and what are the feasibility and what are the disadvantages with the water oxidation uh, for hydrogen peroxide generation. I will be talking about all these things. So uh, before going into uh, uh, 
detail about generating hydrogen peroxide anodically from water oxidation i would like to stress few uses of h2o2 this is used in so many other field like you can see waste water treatment industrial bleaching paper bubble bleaching textile dyes removal disinfection fuel cells organic synthesis you can actually get pure water out of uh, hydrogen peroxide in paint industry it's also used in tanneries and then semiconductor processing where we use hydrogen peroxide to clean up the semiconductor surface like silicon and it, it is also used in electronic industries for making uh, circuits in integrated circuits so h2o2 is clearly a, a universal oxidizing agent which does not uh, pollute our environment upon its use because the currently used uh, oxidizing agents like bleach sodium hypochlorite when we when we use it it produces chlorine gas and sodium chloride it leaves a salt behind so it is not a green process so we need a greener oxidizing agent which is nothing but hydrogen peroxide but the issue is hydrogen peroxide if you look into the hydrogen peroxide what we use in our laboratory daily how it is produced we have this process which is called anthraquinone process which is using anthraquinone which is a highly carcinogenic and has been proven to cause cancerous various uh, cancerous diseases in, uh, related to various organ, organs of human and uh, what they do usually in anthraquinone process is that they take anthraquinone and uh, they hydrogenate it with a noble metal catalyst and they form hydroanthraquinone this hydroanthraquinone upon oxidation with oxygen generates hydrogen peroxide and leaves by uh, leaves back the anthraquinone but this process is not completely reversible there are possibility for forming other anthraquinone derivatives which cannot be used in further cycle so this cannot be done continuously so it has to be done as a batch process because it includes uh, hydrogenation oxidation and then recovery of catalyst and beyond which the hydrogen peroxide synthesized will be in organic phase which has to be transferred to the aqueous phase using phase transfer catalyst so this should be uh, operated as a batch process it cannot be done as a continuous process moreover it uses a carcinogen so which is not good and uh, as we get uh, more and more hydrogen peroxide to phase transfer catalyst to aqueous solution it always result in uh, concentration as high as 70 to 80% which is potentially explosive so this method even though it is easier and older than a century this method is having serious disadvantages even then this is the method which dominates the global production of hydrogen peroxide by 95% which is huge so uh, now in, uh, researchers have understood that this method cannot be uh, used in future as a sustainable method for hydrogen peroxide generation even though hydrogen peroxide is a greener oxidizing agent their met its method of generation is not so green so people have realized that one so they uh, proposed alternate technology which is nothing but the direct synthesis where they uh, um, supply hydrogen and oxygen gas in a close for the two electron oxidation only these two principles are uh, uh, followed so far you can either stick with catalyst having very poor oer activity or you can increase the potential beyond 1.76 volt in this case you have possibility of uh, accompanying four electron oxidation but in this case in the first case you don't have such chance because this material is intrinsically poor or uh, non selective for oer so realizing this people have done so many works recently and they found that zinc oxide is the so far the best catalyst which is actually starting hydrogen peroxide evolution at the reversible potential and also have very high selectivity so i will be highlighting a uh, few work on uh, bismuth vanadate which is also uh, uh, believed to be acting as a photo electro catalyst for uh, hydrogen peroxide evolution as you can see here i said 1.76 volt is for uh, two electron oxidation materials whatever they analyzed here all are starting water oxidation beyond 1.8 which means that the possibility of oxidizing water with four electron and four proton transfer pathway is very minimum and all this material should have higher selectivity for hydrogen peroxide and that's what they observed and with bismuth vanadate they have seen uh, ferritic efficiency of uh, 70% i i have told that ferritic efficiency is nothing but the selectivity so for hydrogen peroxide evolution this particular material showed 70% of uh, ferritic efficiency at 3.1 volt which is very huge which was never observed before in water oxidation electrocatalysis but when they applied 
um, photo photons uh, like they il- illuminated with light they also uh, seen uh, low airing in potential with the help of photons from uh, artificial solar simulator and they observed very good uh, faraday efficiency the faraday efficiency is as high as 100% so this material without photon is good but when we apply uh, a light it still improves its uh, activity to a higher level and particularly for h2o2 selectivity so this work was recently published by she in azure communication following which they also did uh, one more work on uh, carbon fiber paper which is a very common uh, substrate electrode in uh, electrocatalysis and what they did was they have taken ca- carbon fiber paper and they coated with uh, a ptfe a binder which is highly hydrophobic we know with various percentage 5 20 60 percentage they noticed that with increasing amount of uh, ptfe which means the increasing amount of uh, hydrophobicity the current density water oxidation current density lowered as you can see here but the h2o2 selectivity is increased and they uh, attributed that it is because of the trapping of hydrogen uh, oxygen gas evolved within the layer of uh, ptfe and cfe cfe paper so this was the first report uh, in which they showed the influence of trapped oxygen for uh, improving h2o2 selectivity uh, relatively the h2o2 evolution from water oxidation is uh, integrated in a very low number of with a very low number of reports but it it is expected that it will be blooming very rapidly in near future so if you are a researcher working on water oxidation electrocatalysis i would suggest you to look upon this one also because it has huge scope in future because you are going to make a revolution when you come up with a very good catalyst which can produce hydrogen peroxide just from water by applying a particular potential on the site of use where you recover hydrogen peroxide so you don't need to depend on the uh, laboratory h2o2 which has been produced from totally environmentally unfriendly anthropogenic process so this is the aim so yeah with that i would like to summarize water splitting is the greenest way for hydrogen generation of course so uh, noble metals have been making this process unaffordable and they are increasing the cost of production of hydrogen so to uh, overcome this uh, pitfall nano structured materials of non precious metals have helped a little but i also stated uh, later that water splitting is not just for hydrogen generation so many other things can also be done one of uh, few things is that one of few things is that uh, hydrogen peroxide generation and hydroxyl radical generation so these are the things that we can conclude from water oxidation electrocatalysis and one more thing is that uh, people still don't know what makes a catalyst highly selective for uh, four electron uh, four proton oxidation or two electron two proton oxidation which i believe that in situ or operando spectroscopic and microscopic characterization tools will be highly significant in determining or uh, i can say in revealing such myth behind the selectivity difference between few metals so for if you want to have a good oer electrocatalyst stick with the metals i have shown earlier if you want to have a good selectivity for hydrogen peroxide evolution via water oxidation stick with the metals which do not show oer activity so these are the things that you should take away from this uh, i guess yes and uh, yeah beyond this we basically work on electroactivation of small molecules uh, so if you have some interesting catalyst if you think that that could be a interesting catalyst for water oxidation or water reduction or any other oxidation uh, oxidation reduction of any other small molecule which is important in energy and environmental science and technology we will be happy to help you and if you have some interesting molecules that you uh, wish to study uh, about its electrochemical characteristics we can we can also uh, help help you in that aspect so if you think that you could collaborate with us in a fruitful manner you are most welcome to write to me you can uh, write to us so we can have some good collaboration and i would like to acknowledge the funding supports uh, who have been supporting all my research works so i would like to acknowledge uh, japan society for the promotion of science uh, who have been supporting all my research works through the uh, sps fellowship program and i also would like to acknowledge csir india who supported all my earlier research works in thikri uh, via senior and junior research fellowship and this is uh, these are uh, the senior researcher in my group and this is uh, professor noda my current supervisor who have been supporting uh, through all my up, ups and downs and uh, i should not forget to 
mention about my mentor dr kundu uh, yeah without whom i could have not reached this place I, he has taught me so many things and which made me who i am today and i also thank all my advanced electrochemistry course of tutors who taught me all fundamental electrochemistry and uh, all things about electronautical techniques yeah thank you for your patience and if you have any questions you can ask me